I don't know about you, but I am glad that I live in America. We live in a great country. We have lots of freedoms that other countries don't have. We have, we're richer than most uh, other countries, and God has, um, I would say we're pretty blessed to live in the nation in which we live. Back in the late 90s, there was a movie called Blast from the Past, and it's one of my favorite movies, and uh, the movie kind of goes like this. There was this scientist who thought there was, it was the 60s, he thought there was going to be this nuclear explosion, and so he built a bomb shelter underneath his house, a really big bomb shelter underneath his house, and he stored up food for 35 years worth of food. And so, uh, and he had a lock that he had, he had built down there that would lock and seal them in for 35 years. So they were stuck down there. Once they went down there, they were stuck down there for 35 years. And so uh, sure enough, yeah, they saw news and there was uh, some chaos going on. And so he thought that there was a nuclear bomb on its way. And so uh, he and his wife, who was pregnant at the time, went and locked themselves downstairs in the, uh, in the bomb shelter. It turns out that it wasn't a nuclear bomb. It was an airplane that fell out of the sky and ran into their house. And so everybody, of course, thought that they were dead. They didn't know that they were down there. They didn't know that he had this shelter. And so 30, they were down there for 35 years. So now they have a 35-year-old son. And this 35-year-old son has never, ever stepped foot outside of this bomb shelter. And so he grows up watching the honeymooners and listening to Dean Martin and people like that. And so he, um, he goes up into 35 year later America and discovers a very different place. That's where a lot of us, a lot of the church is waking up and finding themselves. We live in what's defined as a postmodern or a post Christian nation. We were founded on biblical principles and biblical values, and we as a country have shied away from them. Much like our church, I'm sure if you went to most churches this morning, you'll probably find a lot of people are not attending service this morning because they're off kind of doing their holiday weekend stuff, and that's what we do on holidays. And Um, we have to ask ourselves a couple questions about what kind of Christianity that we belong to. The idea of America and and being a Christian in America, the way that the world sees it, really, the way that we define a Christian many times disconnects Christianity from the gospel message. And we've settled for nominal Christianity. We've settled for this kind of, if, if I feel like it, if I want to, if I don't want to, we've, we've settled for this easy and convenient gospel that's kind of opposite of what we read in Scripture. And so nominal Christianity is not just deficient, a deficient form of Christianity. It's the opposite of gospel Christianity. That's why we find ourselves in the place where we are. I'm sure if you've spent any time, if you ever watch the news, if you ever look around, the world is not growing more moral. We're not becoming more enlightened to the gospel. It's becoming a a darker and seems to be a more broken place. It seems like every single month you turn the news on or read the newspaper, there's been some sort of crisis or shooting or bombing or or something is going on and it it seems to be getting more and more and what's happening is we're becoming desensitized to these things and they don't grieve us in the way that they used to. But the reason why this is so dangerous and the reason why this is so dangerous to the American church and what, what we've become as a church is because nominal Christianity doesn't start where the gospel starts. We know that the gospel starts with our inability, the sinner's inability to come before God without a mediator. We need a mediator, and his name is Jesus. But nominal Christianity, it teaches us that we can keep from doing some of the things that we don't want to do, but it still sends people to the same hell that unbelievers are going to eventually end up being in. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I want to 
point to a few scriptures. Luke chapter 13. If you've spent any time in church, you've probably heard a little bit about this story. But this is Jesus, and he's teaching once again, and he's going through and healing and doing kind of what he does. And here's what it says in Luke chapter 13, verse number 22. See, we, when, when I say post-Christian America, what I'm saying is Christianity used to be the predominant religion. It used to be the religion of the day, and it used to be what people would be most drawn to, and that's just not the case in our country anymore for many reasons. But here's what Luke chapter 13 tells us, and it kind of gives us really kind of a kind of a way to understand this. It says this in verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Only a few people. And he said to them, Make every effort. There's another word that some of your translations might say, strive. Strive or make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door to us. But, I, but he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught on our streets, in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. He goes on in verse 28, he says, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves will be thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who will la indeed there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. I want you to skip over really quick with me to Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter seven, he is talking about the narrow and wide gates in verse 13 through 14, but I wanna go down to verse number 21 through 23. He's talking about the fruit in our lives and the result of the gospel working itself out in us. And it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. These are some pretty harsh verses. These are very, uh, I would say, kind of scary verses. If you kind of look around the world and, and if we just single out America for a moment, um, if there, we know there are millions of people who live in America, and if there are a few that actually make heaven, then if the statistics prove themselves right, we have to look inside of our churches and look inside of our lives, and we need to understand that that number might gain a little bit inside the church world. But there's a possibility that not everyone inside of this room is going to make heaven their home based off of what he's saying. But he's saying there is a, a narrow door. There's few that go through that door. You could call it a wide gate if you want to. There's a wide gate that's easy and convenient and, and all of those things. And we know that that's not what the gospel presents living for God to look like. It's not easy. But he says in verse 28 that there'll be weeping there if I was to one day find myself in hell, I would be a weeper. Not just because I cry a lot, you guys know me, but I would be a weeper because this picture that he gives us is a picture of distress and being distraught because we knew better. You could almost compare it to experiencing the loss of someone very close to you and just being completely lost and distraught, distressed because 
you knew better and you knew what you should have done. And there's, there won't be enough water in our eyes to cry the tears that we would need to cry being separated from God for the rest of eternity. The other thing he says is there will be gnashing of, gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is that picture we get of people who are hostile towards God, those who are angry at God, those who have rejected him. They hate God. And they'll be angry at God for sending them to hell to where they're being tormented. And we see, God, we see Jesus teaching more about hell than he does heaven, the kingdom of God, and the gospels. And I'm afraid that we in the church world even have taken hell for granted and the reality of what hell is. Because is, have you been to a funeral lately? Every funeral that I go to, everyone's going to heaven. I've never been to a funeral where they're like, oh, sorry, Jim's in hell, so don't be like Jim. I've never been to a funeral like that before. I've been to a funeral, they're in a much better place. They're, you know, they're happy. And of course, they're trying to comfort family, and you're trying to, obviously, you're not going to get up there and say bad things about the person who's lost their lives. But I wonder if we've taken for granted the reality of what not following Christ, the eternal implications are for us. That's the bad news, but there's good news. But I want us to think through a few of these questions that we should ask ourselves. Here's the first question I wanna ask you this morning. What if we're not time travelers from the past, but we're pilgrims from the future? Have you ever met someone who, who lives in the past? Their whole life is based off of their past. What their marriage used to look like, what the church used to look like, what their kids used to look like. All of, the, all of their life dwells in what used to be. But he says, what if we're pilgrims from the future? We're not coming to reclaim something from something that's been lost, but we're here to proclaim someone who's found us who we've given ourselves to. And so the church, in my opinion, needs to reclaim its mission and reframe our perspective. We have promises God made to Christ. We have the spirit of the resurrected Christ living inside of us. So if that's true, we have a tremendous opportunity. The question that I've been asking myself all week is, has the world ever been more lost than it is today? And if the answer is, is no, that, that it has never been, then that gives us a really great mission field. I believe that if we take the opportunity to be the church, we may find that America isn't post-Christian, but instead, it could be a pre-Christian nation. There's so much opportunity in this nation in which we live that we we're blessed to live in. I think we live in a land that's People have never really fully experienced the power of the real, true gospel. Maybe elements of it, maybe pictures of it, maybe they've known people. But this world has not seen a tr a lot of people in this world have not seen a true representation of who Jesus is and who the, gos uh, who the gospel points us to. Verses 18 through 21, this is another ray of hope for us. If you look at Luke chapter 13, verse 18, here's what it says. This is right before he talks about the narrow door. He says, then Jesus asks, what is the kingdom of God like? In other words, I'm about to tell you what the kingdom of God looks like. What shall I compare it to? And he says this, it is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden and it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air perched in its branches. 
this tiny, 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 tiny little seed was planted in the ground. That's what the kingdom of God is like. That's where Jesus reigns looks like. This tiny seed was planted in the ground and it was watered and watered and watered. And it took time if you planted anything. It takes time and time and time and water and water. And then eventually that seed poked its little head through the ground. And then it grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew into a tree. And it became so full, it became a place where the birds of the air could perch in its branches. It was alive. It was bearing of fruit. That's what the kingdom of God is. Is like that's what he's calling us to be people who are fruitful, people who have something to offer this world. We want to be a tree where lost people can come and land in our branches and find safety and hope. He goes on in verse number 20 and he says this again, he asked, This is Jesus, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through. The dough. There was a lot of work that had to be done. It doesn't just assimilate immediately. There's lots of stirring and there's lots of mixing that has to go on. And then he says it will eventually work its way all through the dough. And essentially what he's saying is that's when God has all of us as people. Every part of us. That's when we surrender ourselves completely to him. And he's worked himself all throughout our lives, our priorities, our family. That's what the kingdom of God is like. That's what he's calling us to be. And what we find out in this world that we live in, as opposed to what it may have looked like 200 years ago, is that what matters is not what you say, but how you live. There's a lot of people who talk about God may even talk about church, but what matters is how they actually live their lives rather than what they say. The true test of Christianity has always been about the test of love. How well we love God and how well we love other people. Greatest commandment. That's the true test of Christianity We live in a very divisive culture. This specific year is an election year, and so in election years it gets really, really divisive. And we pit people against people, and this ideology against this ideology, and and what we find out is we start treating people and devaluing people based off of a political preference. I don't care what, you can have a preference. It's okay to have a preference. But someone who votes opposite of you is still a human being made in the image of God. And they're valuable to him. And if we're serious as a church about painting a picture to this world of the gospel, we've got to be painting with the fruit of the Spirit. When we color pictures, when we color a picture to this world of hope for the world, it's got to be a picture that has love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what Christians paint with. That's what we're supposed to be painting a picture of the gospel for this world. Those are the colors that are the witness of Jesus Christ working in us and the power of God at work in our lives. I said it before, we live in a very, very, very dark world. And as Christians, Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world. We live in a dark, dark world, a broken world. And God's calling us to be a light. When everything else is gone, when everything else is dark, 
He's calling Christians. He's calling you and he's calling me. If we were followers of Christ, he's calling us to be this light. To help shine a light to people, a path to him. That's what he's calling us to be. He's calling you and me to be this light. Living in America is not going to lead someone to Christ. Being a Republican or a Democrat is not going to lead someone to Christ. It's men and women who have surrendered their lives to Christ who are willing to grab a friend and shine a light in front of their feet until it leads to God. That's what he's calling us to be. I want you to look with me in Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to end here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 are two of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Too many times we give up too early and we don't get to experience what God has for us because it's not easy and convenient. And we realize over time when we've stuck in there and we haven't given up that God always meets us on the other side. Verse 10 says, Therefore, because we're going to reap this harvest, as we have opportunity, every day that goes by, Every second that passes, every minute that passes, you're losing an opportunity to reach someone for Christ. That's really the reality of it. You're not going to live forever. I'm not going to live forever. Every second that passes in our lives is a second that's slipping away for an opportunity so some man, woman, or child, your brother, your sister, your mom, or your dad, your son, or your daughter doesn't have to spend eternity in torment. Weeping, and gnashing their teeth. So he says, let us not become weary in doing good. At the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. It's time for us as a church not to just dismiss this world as going to hell in a handbasket and wringing our hands that the world's not acting the way that we want them to act. And for us to stand up and be the people of God that he's calling us to be. And so I say, let's love God and let's do good to all people. He finishes this up and he says, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Um, if we can't love each other, it's gonna be real difficult to love the world. And so I've asked Tony to come up and just, we're just going to sing the chorus of Holy Spirit a couple times. You can stand with me. We're just going to sing this song as we dismiss. I want this to be our prayer. That God would change us and shape us. He would fill our, not just our churches with his presence, but he would fill our hearts with his presence. And that we would be the light to a broken and dark world.